take a moment to imagine the picture of a slave. What does that person look like? What are they doing? Where might they live? You might be imagining somebody working in a field, a child working in a factory, or a man engaged in hard labor. You may be thinking about somebody who's living in a far off land. But I wonder how many of you in this room are thinking of somebody who might be living next door to you, somebody who might be living along your street. The landscape of modern slavery has transformed beyond recognition. And it's estimated that there are approximately 40 million people currently enslaved around the world. 25 million of these are considered to be in enforced labor. We always need to err on the side of caution. And so I would suggest that these figures represent a major underrepresentation of the actual number. These figures are simply the tip of the iceberg. We only have to walk along any high street in any given city to find our everyday lives touched by modern slavery. Modern slavery is thriving. Human trafficking alone is just one component of the modern slavery spectrum. And that has become a booming industry that feeds directly into our high street. Human trafficking has become one of the fastest growing areas of criminality around the world. But when you consider that this is just one part of that spectrum, it gives you a sense of the scale of the challenge that we're facing. Modern slavery also includes sexual exploitation, labor exploitation, domestic servitude, right through to organ harvesting and tissue harvesting. Modern slavery is quite simply closer than we think. It's far from being relegated to history. And it's thriving, it's alive and well. It's in the here and now. On any given high street, in any given city, we can walk along and we can pass hotels, supermarkets selling tea, coffee, chocolate, nail bars, even hand car washes, mobile phone shops, laptop shops. Every single one of these areas of goods and services and facilities have been known to have modern slavery in their supply chain. We've seen an increased amount of spotlight on car washes in recent years. And I think there are some really worrying and disturbing stories that are emerging about a small proportion of them. But sometimes we need to just question the price tag of the goods and services that we're engaging with. If you're going to a hand car wash and paying five pounds to have your car cleaned by five adults, the numbers simply don't stack up. We know in our heart of hearts that that doesn't make business sense in terms of a sound business model. And then when you hear the reports that start emerging about the conditions in which those individuals might be living, that again makes you really take a step back and think twice. There have been cases where individuals working in car washes have been living in cramped conditions. They're being ferried from their, their home, essentially, to work on a daily basis and transported back. Just the fact that their, mo their movements are being so closely controlled is a clear sign of slavery and exploitation. In some cases, those individuals haven't been paid a wage. They've been fed false promises and they've been maintained in a bubble of debt bondage, where essentially anything that they do as work, as employment, is being clawed back by the gangmasters to cover the costs, the inflated costs, I might add, 
of their accommodation and of that transport. And in some cases, the only way that they've been able to scrape together any income from that experience is when they've been told they can keep the coins that they find under the seats of any car that they're cleaning or valeting. That's what you can get for five pounds. Equally, we've seen an explosion across the high street of nail bars. And nail bars, again, there have been increasingly causes for concern around a particular proportion of them. Not all of them, of course. But when we go into a nail bar, we're likely to be there for at least an hour. That's long enough to observe the dynamics around us. If we're seeing a situation where there's a bank of women who speak no English, who are avoiding eye contact and feel uneasy engaging with us, that to me is a cause for alarm. If you have somebody who might be watching over them religiously circling the area, that again starts to make you question what you're actually paying for and where that money is going. It makes you question the path that has led that person to that point in time. And it makes you question the life that that person is li living. Understanding the complexities and the nuances of slavery and how it intersects with our everyday life is an important starting point in understanding what actions we can take. But when we think about modern slavery, part of it is certainly taking place in plain sight all around us. But there's also so much that is taking place behind closed doors. And that's why we can never fully trust the statistics. Because this is the point where those figures become a whole area of unseen activity. Behind closed doors, it's not even a case that these days people are having to be chained or shackled in their spaces. They're now being controlled in a different way. Those control mechanisms have morphed over time and been updated. People have recognized what are the pressure points that people can press, that can keep people subservient and obedient in an environment. Control mechanisms can include everything from as simple as false promises through to fraud, but can escalate towards intimidation and physical violence. These have now become items in the toolkit of the gang masters of today. When we think about ethical consumerism, we need to um, be aware of what lies behind the barcode. Because there's always a hidden cost to everything that we buy. It's disturbing to read research that basically says that most of the UK brands do have an element of, of slavery in their supply chain. And some people have argued that for the organizations that claim they haven't got slavery in their supply chains, they're simply not looking hard enough. Some of those top brands that are on our, our high street have become just part of the general scene. And yet we forget too readily the exploitation that is taking place and that is rife in industries such as the garment industry. If we're paying one pound for a t-shirt, what does that actually mean? Where is the value for money? That bargain for us may well be coming at the cost of the lives of others. Rana Plaza is an example of a point in time where everybody stood back and thought about the garment sector and exploitation in the supply chain. Rana Plaza was a factory in Dakar in Bangladesh. There came a day where the women and some of the young children working in that factory went to their bosses and expressed deep concerns. 
they had seen cracks emerging in the floor, the walls, the ceilings of that factory. They went to their bosses and they pleaded and begged not to have to go work, back to work in that facility again. They weren't listened to. The following day was the last time they walked to work. It took 90 seconds for that building to crumble to the ground. And over 1,000 people lost their lives. One thing that was found in the rubble were lots of labels that were due to be sewn into garments that were heading for our high streets. That to me suggests it's time to stop, take a step back and reassess what value for money actually means. When we think about ethical consumerism, we need to be aware of that nudge that is often required because we need to be more focused on reconsidering and reevaluating what we mean by a value for money. As I said, a bargain for us is not a bargain for everybody else in that supply chain. But what we need to think of is how do we move the debate forward? We know it's possible. And we know it's a case that we've seen an increase on the, the high street, whereby you know, we've seen more products that are fair trade products, free range products. But for some reason, we're not seeing that real change, that step change that is required for a mass movement that really recognizes that exploitation has become part of our daily lives. Why are we at a situation where we're willing to tolerate that? There are so many different codes of conduct and initiatives that organizations can sign up to. For example, there's the UN Global Compact, which has a focus on human rights and labor rights. There are big international organizations moving beyond, beyond the, the basics, but so many organizations are just disconnecting from those debates. But equally, you've got initiatives on our doorstep, such as the Code of Practice, looking at ethics in the supply chain. There's no shortage of opportunity. But what we need to do is be putting pressure on organizations to become part of that movement, to represent our concerns. But we also need to recognize that there needs to be a change at, at our community levels, societal levels. Because actually, exploiters will prey on environments that they see as being vulnerable. We can look at vulnerability in a whole range of different forms. But we can see that it's partly about people who may be homeless, who may be uh, you know, dealing with challenges relating to mental health, learning challenges, or may have gone missing from home or social care. But also economic vulnerability is an important part of that mix as well. Because sometimes if people are finding themselves in a situation where they're on zero hour contracts, short term contracts, fixed term contracts, or you have one adult who's working out of the whole family, that limits the life choices instantly of that individual and their family. It limits the options that they see for themselves. And that's a vulnerability that the exploiters will prey upon. We need to be moving towards a situation where we do force those around us to create secure jobs and, to, and jobs that have progression. Because if you don't see progression within your organization, how can you grow and develop? But also, I think we need to think about vulnerability in a different way and recognize that it can touch our lives in a heartbeat. Vulnerability isn't just something that is a characteristic of other people. Literally 15, 50 miles from here, a man in his 20s was held as a slave for 13 years. He worked 16 hours a day over those 13 years and had two days off in total. By the time he was reunited with his family, he didn't even recognize them. We need to recognize that this is something that's happening here and now. 
we need to make sure that we address the, the solution. We become part of that solution. And so I would suggest that we really need to go away from this thinking we can and we must do more. It's hiding in plain sight, in public spaces, in ordinary spaces all around us. So if you think slavery doesn't exist, please think again.